we have with us Teresa Carlson, who is the head of worldwide public sector business at um, Amazon Web Services. Quick intro. Uh, she's responsible for strategy, operations, sales, and BD for the web services and cloud computing business at Amazon. Uh, partnership strategy across all geographies for the public sector. Uh, she was with uh, uh, Am uh, Microsoft Corporation prior to that, running their federal business program that was 1.7 billion in sales, and uh, she's also one of the most hundred powerful women, according to uh, Washingtonian Magazine, and a 2011 Tech Titan. Teresa, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Tad Martin. Uh, the CEO of Collective. He's a uh, co-founder and CEO. Uh, it's a big data network. Um, his firm generates insights to grow revenue and reduce operating costs by answering essential questions on marketing, uh, sales service, and support data. And enterprise-wide analysis is curated, developed by the organization, and then made available to marketing departments worldwide. He's also a seasoned internet company executive. He started his online career in 1999. Um, at uh, e-commerce maker uh, gear.com um, and then he joined Overstock very very early one of the first 30 employees and helped it grow from uh, a 70 million dollar company to a, a multiple 800 million dollar company went from private to public yeah uh, Tad welcome Nick is the senior director of, em of the emerging technologies division of the pivotal initiative uh, enterprise which was just launched yesterday officially by uh, EMC and VMware. It's a combined entity. And um, Nick uh, uh, ran uh, federal operations uh, for Green Plum prior to that. And um, he's a veteran of the US Air Force. Nick, welcome. So I want to start with, and uh, I'm the semiconductor and hardware analyst, as Diane mentioned, uh, Bloomberg Industries. All of our research can be found on the terminal by typing in BI Go. So, you know, I want to frame this big data, data lake question. L let's start by addressing uh, definitions. By putting together data, structured data, unstructured data, and putting it together in one place, real time, um, how is it different from what we have had before, and why is it more intelligent now than from what we've had before? Why don't you start? Well, I think the the approaches of, of big data. I think big data can be a very confusing term. I think a lot of people take big data and it means different things to different people. And f from my point of view, and this is how we approach it as a business at Collective Eye, from our point of view, the purpose of big data for what we want to do is to help support decision making. Being able to find a way to organize information to be able to help make better decisions. And the decision sciences have been around for decades. And so the approach and how you do that, at least at, at a, at a 30,000 foot level, has not changed. Now, when you look at the, the later technologies, things that are coming out, things that, that EMC and Greenplum and, and, and Amazon Web Services are doing and Redshift, there are a greater number of tools that can really help you do that. There's a lot of ways that you can be able to have access to the information that are, that are much easier, much, much more cost effective, and allow people to be able to have better insights into what's going on. What we've done from Collective Eye's point of view is that that is great, but the thing that has always kind of confounded organizations is the application of those insights. How do you find a way to provide the insights to the business in a way that can help them make the decisions? And that is kind of, in, in every business I've been a part of, whether it was gear or overstock and, and, and the things that I see now, there's, there's kind of a divide between the business who are trying to understand what's going on and the technology group that is building the systems to support that and bridging that gap is where that application really comes into play. Teresa, obviously you're, you're the, the scale player in the business. Mm -hmm. um, so based on customer insight, help us understand what you're seeing now in Data Lake and Big Data that you haven't seen before from prior customer experiences. Well, I always like to start with the customer. Amazon's very customer oriented, so we always like to take it from the perspective of what's the customer doing? What do they want? And um, last year alone, we launched over 140 services, and most of those were customer driven, and a lot were around tools for many that support sort of big data. And, you know, what you were just saying, it's really possible now. I mean, things that weren't possible are possible now because of the new technology tools that are actually available out there. 
and customers want to take advantage of, of information that they've had stored out there but haven't really been able to do anything with. They're collecting, you know, the whole, the whole thing drip, right, data rich, information poor. There's so much out there and they haven't been able to really take advantage of that. So what we hear uh, from our customers is help us in real time, on demand, collect the data t and then analyze that data, you know, the data analytics piece and then do something with it. What, what can I do with it? Because information just sitting there is not that valuable unless you're analyzing it and taking advantage of it. And there's so many great examples out there today of what the customers are doing that just weren't feasible. And just one, one quick example that I'll throw out there is uh, researchers. You know, researchers generally, um, that they don't always collaborate in the best ways. Primarily, they've not really had all the tools that they needed. And a lot of times they're in their lab, they're doing, you know, what they need to do. But today, because of big data and tools like Amazon Web Services deliver, they can now crowdsource and come together and take advantage of research and analytics that are available. And one, uh, again, customer example, the National Institutes of Health, we moved the thousand genomes into the Amazon Web Services, that database, which, had, which is, was used, it was sitting there. But today, as a result of moving it, it can be scaled in the first week we put it there, 3,200 new researchers globally took advantage of that. And now they can not only crowdsource and use that data set and not pay for it unless they're, they're, they're not paying anything to actually access it, they pay when they begin to uh, process, compute, and do their own kinds of storage elements. And, and analyzations of it, but the cool thing is now they're actually utilizing the research that others are doing and building on that. So now they can do things like executable white papers where they can use the research that you did and, and now it goes, it, they don't have to start at zero anymore. They can start at 10, 20, 30, 40 percent on those computational algorithms. Uh, and what does that mean though? So what's the result of that? That means that we can speed successes more rapidly and we can begin to see the results and solve healthcare cures, uh, pharmaceutical, you know, cancer, heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the value that we really haven't been able to have in the past now of what big data, and it's so exciting to me because we can solve health problems, energy problems uh, much more rapidly than we've ever been able to do in, in, in our previous lifetime. Nick, I know the Pivotal Initiative has been around for, for a bit, but the official uh, uh, launch yesterday uh, at EMC Strategic Forum. Uh, tell us a little bit about the background and the tools that your firm and you bring to the table to try and uh, analyze the big data issue. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, the, the Pivotal Initiative is, is a combination of assets from VMware which focus on uh, the developer, so the Spring uh, framework, which is used by millions of Java developers worldwide. Uh, big data assets like uh, Gemfire, which are in memory, uh, low latency, some call that fast data sort of components. Uh, and increasingly, the, the components from, from Greenplum, which are largely focused on massively parallel processing data warehousing technology uh, that runs on commodity software and, and Hadoop. Uh, all of this, we believe, will be underpinned by a platform as a service. Our, our viewpoint is that the data fabric is shifting. So to Teresa's point, uh, you know, the ability to aggregate tremendous amounts of data and the cost of doing so is effectively, the, the curve has been completely flattened. Uh, and so for us, that means, to, to Teresa's point earlier, that you can aggregate data in a single location very cost effectively uh, and experiment and iterate on that data and derive products. So a lot of our customers who are deploying big data, the, the sort of big data lake construct, you know, they'll start with a data intensive application. Usually it's something net new in the enterprise. It's a credit card company that's looking to build an iPhone application that understands all of your spending history in the, in the, over the past 10 years, can comb through that data, knows where you're, you are from a geographic standpoint, and issue a coupon to get you to sort of buy a product based on where you are and in the con context of how you've interacted with that merchant in the past. So what we've seen is uh, our view is to consolidate all of these components into a platform uh, with data science, we offer data science services. Uh, oftentimes there's uh, a scarcity of this kind of approach in an organization to accelerate uh, our customers' experience. 
You know, the, I, I'm sure a lot of the audience and, and people who are listening um, have this question, this, why is this different? We've had notions of this, okay, let's get data from different parts of the enterprise. Now we have the notion of unstructured as well as structured data. Put it all in the same place, make it nice and pretty, and then ask all the intelligent questions that we should be asking as an enterprise. How do I increase sales? How do I reduce costs? Why is it different now? Than, than we have had before. Doesn't the data problem already exist? Has, has, it has existed for a long time, hasn't it? Always, there's always a data problem. It's the information, again. It's the, the I think, you know, uh, because of technology, the internet, new marketing tools, uh, ways that people analyze what they're doing. You know, today I was on the Hill yesterday and you'll hear congressional leaders talk about trending on Twitter or Facebook or any other tool, you know, they're looking at, and they, they grab that now, and they look very rapidly and try to figure out how, how is uh, the citizens responding to this, or how's the consumer responding to a new launch of a new product. And it's always been there, but in the past, we were okay as consumers to be able to wait for the, wait for that next commercial, wait for that next uh, mailer that comes in your mailbox to see what's going on. Now we can't wait. We're very, we, we want that information right now. We want to know what's going on and we're, we're information junkies. You know, we have, we, get, we have a new pope now. Everybody was waiting with anticipation and watching their phone or, you know, whatever. So, but what's changed? What's changed is the art of the possible. Um, we have continued to evolve. And again, like the tools we talked about, the tools are changing so rapidly. And I, I want to say because of web services now, uh, the possibilities now are unlimited. The, the innovations, we're still not even touching the innovations that are out there as a result of cloud computing. And you can, inter, you can iterate very rapidly now and solve problems, and your failures can be your successes. Because the things that in the past, when you were developing tools you know, that, uh, to solve a problem, you might have to wait two and a half years to actually have a solution or a tool available. Today, you can try in, in a very inexpensive way using tools like Hadoop. You know, our new, our new tool we just released called Redshift, which is our data warehousing tool that's a tenth of the cost of traditional data warehousing. I mean, phenomenal. It's just, it's growing like crazy because people want to try it out and they can try it. That's the key. They can try it, they can develop something, they don't have to do it in a big way and they can fail fast look at the failures, recover fast, launch their product, and monetize it. And I think that's very, very different than we ever knew previously. Okay, so we, we were talking outside in our, our past couple of conversations. How much of the problem <coughs> is a technology problem versus a, a, a business issue? Uh, you know, John Overton, who is in here, raised this question. Is he suggested that the technology advances for big data are mostly done the business advancers is just getting started. So it was a very controversial sure. statement to make. So yeah. I, I wanna, I wanna have, and, and I also, the s second part to this question is, you know, to Teresa's point, I wanna hear some concrete customer examples where this would not have been possible in the past, say three years ago, and this company is using this technology, this process to say, um, I have produced X amount of incremental revenue or decreased cost by Y by doing one, two, three. So, so, I mean, to Teresa's point, to me, it is really about access from a technology point. I'll get to the business question in a second. It used to be, and when I was at Overstock, we did this, and it was 10 years ago. The only opportunities to solve these decision support questions was to buy enterprise technology and either hire the people to integrate it or hire consultants to help you do that. And that was, if you were really good, a year and a half to a two-year project. Now, with scalable computing with, with these other resources that, that people have, you can do it much more effect effectively. So it allows for greater access. Um, so I'm, I'm a business person. I'm not a technologist. How many, how many people here are, are technology folks? How many people here are business folks? Oh, that's actually the opposite of what I would have expected. Okay, well, well great. So <laughs> from my point of view, and the reason that we developed Collective Eye as we did, all the tools and the technologies are, are there for a purpose. And if your purpose is to do ad hoc querying because you're trying to understand something that isn't a repeatable process, then doing the things that, 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 that from a scale and computer point of view that has cost of access storage and retrieval make a lot of sense. But when you think about areas where 
the application of that data to a process can help you inform those decisions, if that's a repeatable process, then there's no reason not to build an application on top of that. Every organization that I've seen over the last 10 years has business analysts that they, they query data, they produce the same reports for the same people on a regular basis. They, don't, they haven't productized that. We've been really focused on saying, what are the right processes in sales and in marketing? And, and what are the right questions that people are asking? And what, what are the decisions that they should be making so you can then productize that in a way and democratize it for the entire organization? And that has a few benefits. One is, you know that the entire organization is seeing the same answer to the same question. Instead of the, the, the different people in the organization asking for the data and then putting it into Excel and running their, their, their pivot tables and anyone who's worked in Excel knows that you can make the data say whatever story you want, you, you have a single answer across the organization and so you can become much more efficient in how you manage that. Um, it also makes it available to the users when they not need it, not have to wait for uh, the business analyst, analyst to provide it for them. Nick, your thoughts, and I want to hear cu customer examples. You don't have to mention the customer by name, unless yeah. you want to. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if they'd appreciate uh, that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so I think uh, to the point on business and technology, um, one of the phenomenal features of the open source big data community uh, is that it's very vibrant. And so uh, you take a technology like Hadoop, for example. You can store petabytes of data at literally a thousandth of the cost that it would to do this 10 years ago in an enterprise data warehouse. But more importantly, you're not extracting value out of the data as you bring it into the platform. Traditional kind of BI approaches, you land data into some transformation layer, you extract the fields that are, you think are valued. If someone has an a priori sort of sense that they think is value, usually a business analyst, they put it into, into a data warehouse and then they connect it to a reporting sort of an infrastructure. Uh, what things like Hadoop and, and other technologies in this unstructured uh, data space do is they effectively impose the schema on read. So the data in its raw form retains its value and you're extracting based on the question you ask the format that comes off of that system. So what that does is that means that the people providing the technology, the analysts and the developers and the IT organization can much more rapidly answer business questions. So a great example is we were working with a, a large shipping company on a proof of concept about two months ago. Um, and they were trying to figure out, so we have a lot of access to, uh, to their web, web servers to, to track packages. They're trying to figure out how many of those end users are doing this via Android versus iPhone. Which version of iPhone, iOS are they using? Where do I program my development efforts around the user interface? What's, what's most important? So they're able to take all the log files off of every server that they had, every web server dump it in a semi-structured format into a really small Hadoop cluster, like five nodes. Because it does this stuff in parallel, they run a MapReduce job over it and they can extract and aggregate uh, basically a sum of which devices of which type are accessing uh, their, their systems. So this allows them to go make a fact-based decision on where they drive and, and, and put their development um, dollars against uh, 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 future improvements on the interface. And it also gives them a pretty good understanding to take back to the business as to, you know, maybe we should get, you know, a little more aggressive around you know, the way we promote a specific platform, whether it's, you know, iPhone or, or Android, et cetera. Uh, I, I think that, you know, that elimination of, of, of the kind of the technology barrier and the access to data and to Teresa's point, the, the point at which you can fail fast and iterate over it are really driving, you know, the advancements here. So what I'm hearing is technology has become faster, more flexible, and significantly cheaper and this wasn't possible before or would have cost you too much or right. taken too long before right. uh, and it's now doable. So, and from the business perspective, we're just getting started asking the questions or are, we, are, are, are all your customers asking the right sorts of questions? They don't know what questions to ask? Well, they've got to make sure. There's, t there's another piece of this that's really important. <coughs> Who in here in the business world has a data scientist on your staff? So get one now. They're the, they're the new cool. They're the new cool. So the thing about all this that's really interesting, the Wall Street Journal just had, we were, we were chatting about this. I don't know if anybody saw the article. They had like a four-page whole section. Uh, and it was about one of the things that they said in there, 51% of the projects fail because they don't have the right uh, talent. So if you're going to really take advantage of big data, you have to have the right talent. And uh, we're, as an example, working with some of the universities. San Francisco University has a whole program. Uh, I'm on the board of Virginia Commonwealth University. I'm pushing them to do a data science program.
So you need these individuals. Let me tell you, you need these. Marketing is changing. Like what marketing and communications, that is all changing, and it's changing right before our eyes. And some of the, a, a couple of quick examples that I'll share with you when, when we talked about um, individuals. So NASA, uh, so science and space. So NASA, JPL, we, we supported them with their Mars um, Curiosity Landing, and that is just phenomenal. I love it. We're still just getting great information, which we will for years. But they, want, they needed uh, a way to stream all of that information and capture all those images coming down in a very rapid manner. And we worked with them in real time and set this up all up in like a two-week period, did all the testing. Uh, you know, we, we set up the, the pilot site, and we were ready to go. And we all waited in anticipation for that landing. And we're still seeing the great information as well as we work with them on the Mars rover, which this is another just great example. They did not plan well in the budget because, and I don't know if it was planning well, they didn't think the Mars rover would last more than six months. So this little rover is up on Mars running around taking photographs and getting samples, and they didn't want to just shut it off. There's amazing science coming out of that, and they wanted to share that with educators <coughs> and researchers around the globe but they didn't have enough money for that program. So they came to us, they cut their costs exponentially, and that's still running. So that's an example. And one other one that I, I love um, around elections, we work with the Obama for America campaign. And you think about the way we were hit with election information. Uh, and forever will elections be changed in this world because of big data because you can collect the information, analyze it, and that team built over 200 applications in the cloud. And why did they do that? They wanted to save the cost. They wanted to be able to spin up really fast in an elastic manner, and then as soon as the election was over, they shut it down and their cost. You don't have to pay for that cost anymore. But uh, based on the Hadoop and the NoSQL types of databases out there, we're going to have millions and millions and millions of rows that scale out and scale up and analyze it and ask it questions and get the information back, those are the kinds of things that are changing the way we live and work and take in information and make our own personal decisions about buying or who we're going to vote for. So, and it's because I think what you said, it's we're getting information also to ourselves more rapidly as a consumer or as a business to determine, you know, what are the tools that we're going to go out with next to, to develop. So you had asked the question about, are we asking the right questions? And one of the things I consistently run into when we're talking to clients and working with them is they're so used to doing it themselves. They're their own data scientists. Mm -hmm. they're, they're mining the data in Excel to try and find <coughs> the value in, in, in the information that they don't, they're not used to being able to ask the question the right way. What they're doing is they're saying, here's the data. I'm going to figure out where there's, there's problems or things that's going on, but they don't take it, abstract it one level up and say, okay, well, what am I trying to accomplish? What are the decisions I need to be making? And what should I be focused on? And based on the decisions, what choices are my options? And what are the judgments that are going to help me get there? And so we end up working a lot with helping people understand w how to ask the right questions so that they can, that can be translated into. The equivalent of the Oakland days figuring out that getting on base. Mm -hmm was the, uh, what led to win. Yep. It, it wasn't a whether, whether the guy was fast. It wasn't whether you could hit more home runs. It was how do you, at the end of the day, how do you produce more runs than someone else? And there were some basic statistics we got there. Nick, I want to change gears here and, and start talking about potential threats and failures, asking the wrong questions. If I don't ask these questions at the abstracted layer, like you suggested, isn't there the risk, and this is full attribution to Nate Silver on this, I, I love his book, but isn't there a risk of too much noise and too little signal showing up as potential solutions to problems I didn't even know I had? So I've got this, all this data. Hey, guess what? My Icelandic population, our customers are telling me that I should be making everything seven feet tall because <laughs> they eat a lot of uh, whale meat and whale <laughs> meat, damn it, I have to sell more whale meat, whatever the questions are. If I'm not asking the right questions and my data is giving me sort of false positives, if you may. Right. So how do I prevent that problem? Isn't the age of big data, given that we've all become information junkies now, isn't there the risk of too many reactions to a problem that I didn't even know I had? 
Yeah, I mean, this is the, uh, so, so going, going back to <coughs> the, the challenges, uh, one of the, the tweets that I like, if you guys follow, there's a, uh, I don't know who's behind it, but this guy called Big Data Borat. <laughs> and and uh, he tweeted uh, two weeks ago, he said, forget data scientists, I need a data janitor. <laughs> and I think his point was something that we experienced. We, we have a data science team, uh, and they work with customers on, on all manner of, 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 of issues in their respective markets, whether it's you know, predictive analytics, you know, looking at uh, readmission rates at hospitals, or uh, clickstream analytics to do market basket analysis and next best offer and stuff like that. And consistently what they tell us is when they go out on projects is there's a just a massive amount of data and there's a tremendous amount of grooming that goes into preparing them to be able to model and deliver an artifact to their customer. So one of the things that we talked about challenges earlier uh, is that if you're spending 40% of your time with a highly paid data scientist who's you know, basically doing plumbing, you know, that's not probably the right model. And, and so there, there's, there's a level of frustration on both ends, both uh, from a technology perspective, you know, not being able to get the person the information they need, and from a data science perspective, you know, not really wanting to spend time on the more menial pieces of, of the, the job. So what we've done is we've, we've tried to insert architects in the middle who can help kind of translate the business requirements through the data scientist to, to the business user. Uh, back to your point about you know whale meat and and, and sort of you know failed uh, uh, assumptions I guess you know there there was that episode you know two weeks ago where T-shirts were, were were printed by a machine learning algorithm right that said you know something like um, uh, you know use the word rape right in, in, in an inappropriate way and they ended up being you know offered through through a store so that's an example of where things can go awry I still think you need a human in the loop at some point you can't have you know, sort of machines generate, uh, you know, recommendations based on, uh, uh, you know, unfiltered, you know, data. Unless you build a secondary algorithm that checks, you know, and acts as a human on, on that on that conclusion. Uh, so that's that's kind of what I would I would say about uh, about that. Yeah. Are, are you finding this um, among your customer base as well, Teresa? Are are, are people um, do do they run the risk of overreaching? Well, I, I'd like to say I think that they potentially are, but I don't even think we're there yet. I mean, I think that the janitor concept makes a, maybe sense, except for the fact I believe this, there's companies out here that have a lot of intelligence about their own business. So if you apply what you just sort of said at a very grand level, yeah, potentially, but, but I think that we're at such a nascent part of this that we're learning so much that You've got to be practical about how you do this. Obviously, you can't, you know, you can't go crazy. You have to, and I hear federal agencies talk about this a lot because the U.S. government has more data than anybody in the world, right? And they're collecting it every day, and they love that. I mean, it's their world intelligence on what's going on and how they, how they process that. But I would say within the companies and agencies, they've got to be practical. So you have to take the right common approach steps to say, I'm going to utilize a segment to get going. I'm going to take a subset of something that's really important to me and I'm going to start there and ha again have lessons learned. Don't boil the ocean. I mean that's the reason projects do fail. You boil the ocean and, and there's, there's a couple of just quick examples that I'd like to say like uh, the Ant Berkeley Lab is doing things like they're, so where you can really do something in a way that makes sense, they're actually taking a million patients and they're looking at their genomics and they're mapping their genomics, so a million cancer patients, different types of cancer for their machine learning lab, and they believe that as a result of being able now to map all this within 60 years, maybe earlier now, that all these cancer types will be able to live within a chronic basis instead of a uh, terminal basis. So predictive, doing predictive health versus, you know, you're, you're always sort of doing a backwards, you have cancer now, how are you curing it? So uh, we have a NOVA here locally that's looking at things on genomic patterns of infants. So if you, so our, you know, 10, 15 years from now, when we go into a doctor's office, they'll be looking at our, at our genomic patterning, and they'll be treating us based on that. So if you think about the way you can, again, begin with a problem and don't boil the ocean. And I think if you can begin with something that makes sense and not say, oh my gosh, I have all this, now what do I do with it? 
yeah, that could be a problem, but I think people are practical about their businesses, and if they apply it to a common start, start small and figure it out, and then you can grow fast. Then you can figure out how you scale that. I want to pivot to Matt Barry to see if we have any questions. <coughs> uh, we do have one. Uh, the question is, informationmanagement.com breaks big data down into three pillars, platform, analytics, and data governance slash data management. Pillars one and two have been discussed, but data governance has not been touched on. Can someone on the panel discuss the importance of data governance and data management? Anyone want to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think, I think, I think data governance, data management are obviously hugely important, um, and and in part because there are so much more data available. I mean, from so many different sources, and you have so many different touch points with your clients and customers that understanding how you going to management and how you're going to protect the things that need to be protected are very important. And and, and in this day and age, when you have news stories about hackers and China mm -hmm. trying to <coughs> access uh, your data from, from all sorts of different businesses and governments here in the States. You have, to have, you have to have the right procedures and policies in place to make sure you're securing the data in a way um, that's meaningful. The, the hard part when you think about it from a data point of view, and this goes back a little bit to the conversation we're having before, if you start with a problem and understand what you're trying to accomplish, the amount of data you need to, to answer that question is much smaller than you probably think. The amount of data that can really help you deliver an answer is, is, is not 100%. It's probably 3%. So thinking about data management from a, a point of view of the data you need, you don't need to store everything, in my opinion. It's, it's only the data that you, you need available to help you answer those questions. If you can do that, you can help limit uh, what you need to do. And that's where likely technology come into the uh, to, to circle back. Yeah. Is that that data might be in different parts of the organization, and now we can put it together in a reasonable time frame at a reasonable cost. Yeah, I, mean, I think that the notion of uh, of data collaboration is, is really kind of bending the rules around traditional data governance, right? So you look at regulated industries and the amount uh, they're they're regulated by the you know they've got to keep data for seven, ten years, whatever the industry is. There's only certain people who can look at that data. Uh, you know, we're doing projects in, in Europe where PII is, is treated a lot more, um, you know, significantly than it is in the United States. So if you're collecting information on a cell phone real time because you want to, uh, you know, mine that data and then serve some sort of mobile uh, device interaction back to, to the application, you've actually got to anonymize that data in flight. Uh, so I, I think it's still evolving. I actually think the big data is probably turning the whole concept of data governance on its head for those very reasons. One is you're now collecting, you know, potentially petabytes of data in a single source, which if, you know, compromised or inappropriately accessed within the enterprise has, you know, long-ranging effects um, across, you know, across the business and, and, and the trust in that business that has that data. Uh, you add to the fact that you're actually combining that data with other data sources to build derivative products. And how do you treat that, right? We we're working with, uh, uh, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, and they wanted to do some modeling around, um, you know, looking at threats. So today, you can go down onto data.gov and, and look at train tables, you know, when, when trains are on time, when flights are on time, and, you know, bad guys could potentially use that data, combine it with when they know periodic maintenance is going to be done on a nuclear reactor or something like that, and come up with and triangulate when, you know, fissile material was being moved from site A to site B. So, you know, how do you deal with those derivative products that either you yourself build and provide to a customer, or how do you protect someone else from building something nefarious out of them, which I think are, are interesting things to think about. And can I just say something real quickly on that, too? The, there's nothing, the design ar and architecture of systems, no matter where they are, is still super important here. So if you need to encrypt, you know, in transit at rest at the cell level, who has access if you have reserved instances and your hardware is reserved. So those kinds of things are still really important even in the data governance piece. It's based on whatever that industry is, their security standards, their model. But good architecting and designing of the system still really have to come in play here. Uh, so, uh, we have one question. This is for Nick. Can you talk about Project Serengeti at VMware and how it sells big data as a service? 
Uh, yeah, so, so Serengeti is uh, an open source uh, project that VMware developed that basically allows you to provision uh, virtual instances of Hadoop. So uh, we're seeing a, a rise in the need to have analytics as a service, whether <coughs> on-prem uh, or off-prem. Uh, Hadoop and, and, and technologies like that have traditionally been uh, leveraging bare metal uh, sort of system performance, mm -hmm. and, and things like hypervisors generally tend to inhibit some of the key benefits of, of bandwidth uh, consumption, et cetera, virtual networking. Uh, so what the folks at VMware did was they built a provisioning tool, contributed it back to the open source community that allows VMware customers to effectively go into their environment, stamp out a 50-node you know, virtual Hadoop cluster, and deploy it in minutes versus sort of you know a more monolithic way, which would be to kind of buy servers, rack and stack them, load the operating system, et cetera. It really just eases the deployment. I, I, before before we take one more question, I, I just wanted to get sort of the top mi either misperceptions or takeaways from, from if people wanted to leave today and they wanted to take only two things from each of you, what would those two things be? Well, I, th I, I, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but understand the business problem you're trying to solve. If you can identify what decisions you're trying to make, let's set aside the data mining problem, which I think is, is a, probably a panel in and of itself, but if you can understand what problem you're trying to solve and you can work backward, you can understand what are the right technologies, what are the right data that can help you understand that, and you can build a, a, a product that's really going to be helpful to you. If you start from the bottom up, it's, it's much harder to get there because you're, you're, you're boiling the ocean. You're, you're, you're building something much bigger than you need. Greater likelihood of being overwhelmed, too. Yep. I would say try some of the new tools. I mean, I still hear a lot of people say they don't, they don't really understand how they take advantage of web-based or cloud-based tools. So set up a small SWAT team, understand the business problem, set up a small SWAT team inside, and try out some of these things and benchmark them and see what works. Because today, like most tools are built in building block manner, so you can use them and build on those tools. And then, again, just try it out because it's not going to cost you that much today, and it's really... I think it's going to be very informational, and you're going to you're going to glean glean some key understandings as an organization of what you need to move forward with. Mick, uh, I, you know, I would say two things. One, uh, be rational about the expectations. So, to the earlier points, I think it, it boils down to picking a problem that big data is good at solving, and that has high impact. Otherwise, the the fear of uh, sorry, the the side effect of failure. You've got this hangover, right? You're in the trough. Of, of a big data implementation. If you haven't delivered that killer app up to the business that's data infused and is really driving a uh, business forward, that's considered a failure. And then I would also say uh, on the back of that, begin you know, with the end in sight, right? Because these things grow really fast. You know, we, we see systems go in at a couple petabytes, uh, terabytes rather. And you know, once that use case is proved out, business comes knocking at the door and they want five or six more applications on top of it and it just drives the volume through the roof. So architecture and beginning, you know, with the end in, in mind really matters. Got it. Do we have time for one more question? Uh, there's no more questions that have come in. We've got about two minutes. Okay. So, I, I, so b the bottom line is technology prices have come down, flexibility has been increased, and the time to potentially solving the problem uh, with a large amount of data coalescing in the same place, structured, unstructured, is better now. Business problems still remain. Um, we still have to try a few different solutions uh, or a few different uh, approaches before we get a hang on it and be rational about expectations. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, panelists. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.